This is Rob Gray from ASU and PerceptionAction.com. Today on the Perception and Action podcast, my interview with Danny Newcomb, lecturer in sports coaching and PE from Oxford Brooks University. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Perception and Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, my interview with Danny Newcomb from Oxford Brooks University. If you listened to my interview with Dave Collins from a couple weeks ago, Danny is a great example of a term that Dave likes to use, a pracademic. Along with being an active researcher, he coaches field hockey at a few different levels, including the Welsh national team. He is currently embarking on a PhD project that will dig deeper into how the constraints-led approach is being used by coaches and whether or not it is effective, which is, as we discuss, a tricky question to answer. Other topics we discuss include applying the constraints-led approach to practice design and physical education curriculum, research on the constraints-led approach, what does it tell us about its effectiveness, and are we using the correct methods of evaluation? Hope you enjoy. Not ten years ago, I was a child. I was a good boy and you let me go. Now I'm on a talk show, talk show. Today my guest is Danny Newcomb, Senior Lecturer in Sports Coaching and Sports Science at Oxford Brooks University. Thanks for taking some time to talk with me, Danny. No problem, my pleasure. So I'll start off, I'll ask you my favorite question uh, to begin with. Can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got interested in sports science and coaching? Yeah, no problem. Undergraduate in sports science at Cardiff Met University. Mm-hmm. Finished that one and decided to do a master's in sport and exercise science at the same place. And, and kind of these things happened, ended up as lab technician and sort of associate lecturer and, and, sort, of, and sort of cut my teeth that way. But at the same time, I almost started coaching as well, mm-hmm. alongside. And then I moved out of sports science, so kind of away from measuring things, and into coaching, which sort of my, my kind of focus really tra- changed when I moved to Oxford Brooks. I found I loved teaching. I just didn't love physiology. So um, <laughs> I was kind of really more interested in pedagogy and coaching, and, and that's where the change happened really. Oh, great. So right in your job now, are you kind of doing a mix of all three things, teaching, research, and coaching? Yeah, so I kind of lead the coaching modules on our degree. So all of the practice to theory modules that we do across the year, that, that's kind of my baby of the minute. Oh, great. And what kind of coaching are you doing right now? So I coach the assistant coach of the Welsh national team hockey, field hockey. And then I coach a national league hockey team in London. And then we do a lot of primary school work in terms of curriculum design and game design there as well. So. Great. Well, I must keep you busy <laughs> traveling around. So so the main thing we wanted to talk about today, you know, I wanted to have you on talk about is the constraints-led approach to coaching, which you've implemented in a few different ways in coaching and we'll get to along in terms of PE curriculum, like you mentioned. You know, I've talked about this a few times in my podcast, but uh, I haven't really dug really deep into it. So to start off with, how did you get introduced to this approach and kind of what drew you to the kind of this constraints-led approach to coaching? Yeah, I guess it was when I started coaching, I almost, as you do, regurgitate what you experienced and you kind of copy. And, and I was coaching a, a team in Wales, uh, a ladies team, and it just dawned on me that there was just no transfer between what we were doing in training and and the game and we were getting better in training we were getting better at the drills and and the practices but we still weren't doing that in in training and and that's what really forced me to look at what i was doing and and why i was doing it and there's a few key people that sort of introduced it to me and and sort of planted seeds and you know have you read this have you looked at that and and then i just got immersed in it and was like this it fits everything works it's it's the perfect framework to allow me to have the flexibility but at the same time provide practices that are most likely to transfer to the game the drive came from practice really rather than from the theory it was sort of that kind of frustration i think (laughs) yeah so yeah i think i see a lot of coaches kind of some of these ideas kind of bubble up and then they found the theory and it's like wow (laughs) there's something that supports my crazy ideas yeah 
So maybe getting a bit more into detail about it, how do you use CLA in practice design? So I know you, I saw you think about the five principles that you use for kind of implementing. Can you talk a bit about that in a bit more detail? Yeah, so I think that it's been quite well documented and accepted of David Renshaw's mm-hmm. work of what is a constraint side approach. And I think the academic communities, the evidence is really there. It was the transfer of those ideas to practice which was what i was kind of struggling with and bridging that gap it's very uh in vogue at the minute to say you're uh you're doing a constraints led approach and uh, you know that's what you're what's driving your practice and these ideas came from helping our undergraduate students get their head around it and then using it and implementing it in practice and, and that's where these principles were kind of created because a lot of what we were seeing was people using constraints but not not particularly effectively Mm-hmm. and consistent with the theories that underpin them and partly that's because they didn't understand what underpins them but then a lot of that wasn't that accessible to them anyway so there's this gap between what was happening in the theoretical world where it all sounds great and you buy into it and then you in the practical world and you see them doing it and it's just that's really not what <laughs> <laughs> these principles were designed to bridge that gap but provide enough flexibility for context and your practice but almost keep it true to its two main origins, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are a couple of the principles maybe that you use? The two main theories that underpin it, in my understanding, would be the dynamic systems complexity type debate and ecological psychology, which together become ecological dynamics. So an understanding of that isn't the easiest. So the use of them wasn't fitting that. So I'll give you an example, which will be easier. There's a practice going on and it's a 5v5 game. Let's take field hockey because that's my, uh, my area. So normal 5v5 game. Two goalkeepers, two goals, and some outfield players in a small-sided game. And the coaches would see that the players were carrying the ball too much, dribbling too much, and, and causing turnovers. And, and they'd want them to move the ball on earlier, pass the ball earlier. So they'd go, I know, I'm going to employ my constraints-led approach here to uh, facilitate that happening. And you're only allowed two touches would be the rule they would implement. Mm-hmm. And our frustrations with that are that... You're providing them with the answer. It's not an emergent decision. You're removing the key triggers and cues from that decision. The defenders know that they're only allowed two touches, so that changes how they interact with them. And the whole thing becomes almost false. So these kind of principles were designed to sort of circumvent a lot of those issues. So the first one being constrained to afford. So understanding what affordances are and why they're so important and then using constraints to create those or provide those is the key to the first principle. So if I want the players to move the ball on early, I need to provide them with the opportunity to move the ball on early so they can interact with that affordance. So I don't know if you've talked about this before, but affordances, we believe, are opportunities for action. Mm -hmm. And if they haven't been provided with the opportunity for action, they can't kind of engage with it. So the ideal opportunity for action to move the ball on early would be a free teammate in a good position to receive the ball. So I would constrain the environment. So I would probably provide an overload with a kind of magic player or floating player, which played on whichever team had the ball, in which case there would be more often to move the ball on early. And that doesn't mean they have to move on early because sometimes you don't want them to. You don't want to strip their number of touches because there's a time and a place not to, not to do it. So you don't, that first thing is to offer them that opportunity. You then probably want to encourage it or exaggerate it. So you could introduce some form of point scoring system that rewards you know, moving the ball on early at the right time, sort of some bonus system, but still not saying they have to move on early or they can only have two touches or they're only allowed three seconds on the ball. If the practice is about width and they're all crowding around the ball, the first thing you do is you've got to offer them width. So you change the, you know, the task constraints and change the, the size of the pitch. That doesn't mean they're still going to explore it. So you then might need to encourage it a little bit more. So you could put some channels out there that they get bonus points for going in. And the normal trap that's fallen into is that you must go into that outside channel before you score. Then as the defenders, we know that. So we change and then the space is in. Yeah, so it kind of or we put goals in the corners, but then all the defenders migrate to the corners and the space is down the middle. So, so you've really got to be almost clever about how you use constraints to bring about the affordance that you want them to interact with. Reverse engineer it a little bit. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think it ties back to the, you know, what you mentioned at the start, transferability, right? It's equally easy to design a constraints approach that's not transferable. The idea is you're constraining the situation 
but you they're going to play in the full one again, right? So, so you want them to be able to recognize this quick touch, moving the ball opportunity. And it happens less frequently, but when it does happen in the full game, you want them to be able to react and recognize the affordance, yeah. Yeah, so we use Does Your Environment Offer, Invite, mm-hmm. Encourage, the opportunities for action that you want them to engage with. And the other phrase we use is use the carrot, not the stick, or don't over-constrain. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second principle is kind of representative design. The sort of phrase we'd use underneath would be, does the environment feel or is what the learners are feeling like in the game? So it's trying to remove the kind of decoupled nature of practice. And it doesn't mean you can't do some 1v1 practices and you can't do stuff that's not a game. It just has to be game-like and the, and the kind of what they're seeing and feeling and, and hearing needs to be similar to what they'd be seeing, hearing and feeling the game and then if it is it's more likely to transfer across the third one is around kind of variation so repetition without repetition i still believe they you know learners need lots of goes lots of practice lots of repetition it just needs to kind of be different every time and and you know all the research is pointing towards the fact that you know elite performers and and experts have more variable movement patterns Mm -hmm. at certain points and they're more stable movement patterns at at other points at the essential points of, of that movement so that's the third one. The fourth one, people call it stretch or, you know, if, if the dynamical system's self-organizing, it needs something to organize against. So if there's no instability, then they've already got the answer to the question. So there's no learning or organizing that will take place. If there's too much instability, then they can't access it and it's too chaotic for them. So no learning will take place. If you can provide an optimal level of instability for that learner in that context, then learning is more likely to take place. We often give the analogy of a computer game. So imagine, you know, you're playing Angry Birds, Pac-Man, Space Invaders. You know, if you, you played level one and they ask you to play level one again and then level one again and then level one again, you'd get good at level one, but you know, there'd be no learning that would take place after that. The same as if we gave you a game and said, Oh, can you start at level 50? You could have a go, but you just wouldn't be able to access that kind of level of complexity. So it's about providing the kind of optimum amount of instability which is an art and nuanced and you know when you've got a wide diverse group not not an easy task for a coach but something we could kind of strive for Mm -hmm. uh, if we can and then within the sort of layer of stuff after this is around the kind of you um, look to the life forms optimal grip kind of niches literature that's sort of coming out around it's a bit more complex so if you've got a cup final that Sunday, your Thursday night session, you need to manage the amount of instability in it. And sometimes you're not trying to provide uh, an optimal learning instability. You might actually just be managing the correct amount of instability for that group of people at that time to perform in that week. So um, it's not as simple as, and, and I think there's some stuff that will come out in the next sort of couple of years around similar to like overload within training. Mm-hmm. Can we overload our players cognitively? And, and is that how much stress can they take and do we need to sort of periodize and, and manage that instability over a week or a month for those players so that they don't get overloaded and frustrated with practices all the time that are constantly stretching them and starting to manage that bigger picture of, of those athletes. And then the last principle for me is consequence. So it's a bit like, you know, we run fastest when we're being chased, you know, the human nature side of, of it, you know, we need to provide that real life consequence for their actions in that environment. So, Practices in hockey that are not two-dimensional, which means when we don't lose the ball, we don't have to track back or chase. If we get infinite number of goes at that practice without any sort of real consequence to losing or winning or doing well, so it's okay, we'll mistrap that one, we'll get another ball, it's okay. So providing that kind of pressure, if you like, of accountability for that phase of play. So simple things like restricting the number of balls or goes they get. And then counting the number of points they get out of that goes. The use of sort of magic balls or golden balls that are worth valuable, worth more than the others, you know, which then starts to create that that real game life consequence over that ball that we're trying to create. So yeah, that came to me from you'd get a good practice, but they'd almost be going through the motions. Mm-hmm. And it's nature. you you answer the question that you're being asked. And if there's no real consequence, then you don't really push yourself. I think I spoke to a, a guy called Chris McLeod, an EIS. Um, S&C coach and he showed me some data with the netball and they were doing sort of straight line sprinting you know they tracked them so they did it on just straight then they did it raced and obviously the time went up 
and then they offered them 30 quid a day and could improve their time. There were some spikes in a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how little you need to uh, motivate <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, certain, certain personalities. Though. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter. It could be one. Got some some big jumps in in speed yeah. because of the human, human nature side of it. And you have to create that intent or that, that consequence that's as close to the game possibly can so that they interact with the affordances in the same way that they would interact with them in the game or as close to you can never truly represent it. So, you know, international hockey, there's only one thing that really prepares you and that's playing international hockey test matches. The closer we can get in training to that, then the the better really. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. A lot of interesting stuff there. So when you're talking about instability, are you talking kind of a systematic or does it also involve kind of like uh, the word that sometimes we use in team research here is perturbation, where you suddenly change the rules on people, uh, or you do, you know, you do a really big uh, kind of bomb on them uh, that they don't see coming. Is there is there part of that to it as well? It can be technical overload or cognitive overload, or if they're okay with a three on two and they're, and they're completing that, can we move it to a four on three where there's more decisions, more more things moving in the environment that they've got to then compute and take in we play a lot of eight on eight because it's it bridges the gap between sort of our small unit play and then 11 on 11 it's just a little bit less to to compute and if you play a four on four with under eights they all crowd around the ball because they can't compute the amount of complexity in the system so they just migrate to the most attractive thing in the middle if we reduce that the amount of stuff that's moved all the noise if you think that's moving in the system then they'll be able to filter out a little bit so the free energy principle and the stuff that's coming out on optimal grip, I think, really helps us understand this. They talk about optimal grip is the ability to interact and filter out noise and, and interact with the affordances in the system you know, to their advantage, and, and that's what optimal grip is. I think it's called skill in a lot of other literature, but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> it does understand it kind of in linked into this. So yeah, I agree with your point. It's the perturbations you cause. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in the system. So we, we do a lot of scenario training in, in ours. So, you know, eight on eight, but we'll then suddenly send a player off. You've got to now manage that or send two players off. How do you manage that? You know, your best player is now injured, you know, and, and you try and create those scenarios that they would, that normally would create the chaos in the game kind of in your, in your training. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And take your training kind of adaptability. And so how do, what is your experience with how players respond to this approach to coaching? Depends on the age and their training history a little bit. They get used to it, and after a while, it's it's kind of becomes normal, and they enjoy it. You know, I get asked, "What's today's riddle?" and for those types of things. So it allows you to add way more variety to your to your practice, which I think is you know hugely key for motivating a group of players over over a season. And you know, and the other thing I've produced, which I, I don't know if you've seen, is kind of continuum of environment design that moves from macro game, which would be eight on eight, 11 on 11, mm-hmm. down all the way to kind of unopposed to drill. And everything in the middle from a small unit play to a small sided game to one-on-one practices or more variable practices. And I think there's a danger of people just thinking that this is a to run a small sided game, a five on five, and, and that's what this means. I think there's a huge variety. I do a lot of one v one work, a lot of 2v2 work, you know, that's game-like and, and using a constraints of approach that the players tend to, to really enjoy. They still want lots of touches. So playing big games all the time doesn't always give them that kind of repetition and mastery element that they want while still kind of being consistent with this theory. Does that make any sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was kind of related to the question I was going to ask. I think some people, when they think about strengths that approach the idea that you just take a complete novice and throw them out there and they learn yeah. everything about the skill on their own. There's some basic technique that has to be mastered before you can go into the this, right? Yeah. The bo- like basic ball handling skills. Is there an optimal stage to start introducing constraints? Approach well, or? I think you do it from the start. It's just how you do it with complete novices is different to how you do it with, with an elite hockey team. It looks different. You're still following the same mm-hmm. principle. You're just providing them with an environment that they can access. So it, it take, let's take, for example, the one you gave. And it's the challenge I get asked. Or don't they need this, you know, the basics first before you can put them into, you know, this environment? And and I would say cones have got got a lot to answer for. And and you know we want them to, you know, practice their ability to manipulate the the hockey ball. But the problem most people have with players when they carry the ball is they look at the ground. 
Now, you know, ask coaches how these players learn to dribble, and they'll normally say, well, round cones. And my next question is, well, where are the cones? Well, they're on the ground. <laughs> um, that dynamical system has learned to solve the problem that the coach has presented with them. Then the coach will say to them, I want you to dribble around the cones, but I want you to look up. And I want a six-year-old to turn around to a coach and say, are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> like, the cones on the ground, why on earth would I look up? <laughs> it, it makes no sense. So we need to provide them with environment that allows them this ability to interact with it and, and practice this manipulation, but also that requires them to look up while they're doing it. So it, just simply moving them into a small area and asking them to carry the ball around each other and in, in and out of each other, all of a sudden they're having to avoid someone, you know, which is game-like okay, and representative, but they'd all get their own ball still. They'd all get lots of goes and they'd all be able to sort of practice that. And then you can get in and help them. That's the key that people don't realize. You've still got a scaffold. You can still go in and, and use analogies and ask questions and, and help them to recognize and spotting those human movement things and, you know, helping them understand the principles of good ball carrying are still, is still there. You know, if you want your sort of three year old to learn to swim, you don't just chuck them in the swimming pool and walk away and go dynamical systems. It's good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like they'll be all right. You've got to help them. So yeah, it, it's a nuanced approach to it. But I think we need to challenge the real decoupled kind of non uh, and the stuff around sort of conscious control. I'm really interested in as well. So if their focus of attention is it needs to be not on what they're doing, and if we can provide an environment that's got other people in it that they've got to dribble around, they'll be focusing a little bit on them as well, which will take their attention away from their body, which will allow it to naturally self-organize. If we're just saying dribble around these cones or just repeat this movement, they're focusing so much on what their left arm's doing, where their foot's going, that they they're almost circumventing that that kind of self-organization that should be happening kind of implicitly and, and naturally, which kind of moves us straight into the what, the way we start with this PE curriculum. We kind of kind of wanted to come up with the argument of or sort of the the answer to that, and we had a crazy idea, and we thought, why not try it? Rather than being academics sitting in our ivory towels and saying, "Oh, PE should be done wrong," you know, should be done differently. <laughs> actually, do you know what? Should we actually do this for once? So three or four years ago, a group of us sat down and went, well, let's do it. Let's let's design a curriculum that's play-based, fun, not sport, not functional movement. So we removed sport in the first instance because it's exclusive. It's um, it's not for everyone. The discourse of it's quite threatening. Mm -hmm. Most sports have one ball, which is colonized by the bigger, faster, stronger, better. They get better, and then the ones who don't get to have a go don't get any better so that's one of the first things we removed we wanted to create a load of wide access games so we use the phrase kind of low floor high ceiling mm -hmm. for, for these games so that they everyone can kind of access and interact with them we wanted the learning to be as implicit as possible um, and kind of emergent which kind of fits the kind of ecological we wanted to provide them with a huge range of environments to interact with it's the david's phrase of you know we wouldn't realize our ability to interact with water if we you know, we're never given that opportunity. So our job in PE is to provide them with, you know, as many different environments that they can interact with as possible. Mm -hmm. And then cleverly hiding the learning and the development within those games. As far as they know, they're playing bear hunt or cowboys and Indians <laughs> or, or, you know, um, and actually that's the, the more they have fun and interact with the games and then it's kind of that real world, oh, it's pirates and it's, you know, <laughs> What they can't verbalize at six the crazy amount of stuff they're doing and, and how good it is. All they know is they're, you know, they're solving that game problem that's put in front of them yeah. and are engaged in these lessons. It's a research project, really. The engagement in lessons is, is through the roof. Mm -hmm. Kids engaging in PE that never engaged in it before. And kind of our job was to look at this, the physical literacy piece and go, what makes a physically literate person? Let's design 108 games that kind of will help and facilitate that development. So I think the whitehead physical literacy stuff around um, embodiment and self-realization and, and the confidence and, and competence to move and interact with environments was the, was what we were aiming for. Mm -hmm. That's been taken by a lot of people and, and put into sort of this, this functional movement, squat, lunge, land, catch, which is true. It's not sport and it's physical literacy, but it's dull. Um, <laughs> you know, and... and one thing we wanted to do was change their the children's relationship with physical activity and and, and exercise and they want we wanted to make it fun and colourful and they want so they want to do it. Mm -hmm. The game bear hunt is they've got to get from one end of the hall to the other. In the hall, there's just a load of spots on the floor. 
they can only move on the beat of the drum from spot to spot. They have to go and get some food from the other end of the hall while it's only landing on the leaves. Meanwhile, there are hunters that are also on spots that can also move one spot at a time when the beat drops. So they're practicing evasion and, you know, avoidance. They're also practicing their landing mechanics without knowing it, their jumping mechanics without knowing it. You can play around with the speed of the drum, the rhythm, which then will change their landing mechanics and how they change. Rather than going, right, we're going to stand on the line, we're going to practice landing. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's happening anyway. And because the external focus is on the hunters and the game and they don't know they're doing it. So all these kind of physical literacies, if you like, all these movement skills will be developed just without them knowing it. Yeah, it reminds me of that, you know, when you sneak kids' vegetables in, <laughs> in fruit <laughs> by blending it with smooth fruit. <laughs> yeah, it's um, funny you say that, actually. The guy we're working with, um, he used to run a company called Ella's Kitchen, which does kiddies' food pouches, which makes vegetables and fruit into <laughs> smoothies. I know it kind of goes against the the idea, but do you, at the end, do you anticipate like testing them on the traditional movement screens and s to show that they are developing them without using the traditional approach? Yeah. So for other Brooks, this is a huge research project that's mm -hmm. just starting. So the first research piece is looking at engagement in lessons and activity levels in lessons as a result of the two different like, traditional, if you like, versus play-based approach. After that, it's, yeah, developing an assessment tool that will reliably, you know, give us a measure of whether they're more physically literate as a result of this curriculum as opposed to a more traditional one. A bit of a minefield. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if we're looking at, you know, these self, try and measure self-realization, really. Um, <laughs> so we're more interested in them, not necessarily how far they throw, but understanding how far they throw, how I throw, and therefore how I solve the problem yeah. um, in front of me. So if I know I can only throw 10 meters and I'm 20 meters away, I need to run 10 meters to then throw. That for us is self-realization. Mm -hmm. Measure that. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, if we all looked at uh, a game with you know 20 primary school children playing it, we'd all pick out the same kids that were more physically literate. They more move more fluently. They're more economical. They make better decisions. They interact with the affordances better. We'd all pick the same group of children. But the minute we reduce that down to try and measure variables, it's very contradictory to the entire approach itself. Mm -hmm. So the, the kind of philosophical grapple we are, we are having, uh, we will, we will have to reduce down and measure some stuff in order to kind of really prove this works. That's what we're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. We can't say, yeah, we watched a load of pee and <laughs> <laughs> they, they look like they're having fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, yeah, no, it's a tough problem. And I guess that relates to the other thing I want to talk to you about, you know, so CLA has been around long enough that people are starting to uh, review and see, you know, is it effective? Ask whether, you know, can we look at a body research to see whether it's effective or not? And I know you've been looking into that a little bit. And the challenge is you, you already hinted on it. The way that we're going to evaluate it is might not fit with the traditional way we evaluate training in sports science. Right. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? The whole point of a CL approach is to transfer. We've got to measure how effective it is in a performance environment. Otherwise, we're not measuring transfer. So, however, it's hard to measure things reliably in performance environments. So you'll see a lot of the researchers reduce the complexity of the tasks down to things they can measure in a lab. So basketball shooting, closed, putting, table tennis shots. But they'll reduce down the complexity so the feed will be consistent. You know, it will be measured in a closed environment which then removes the entire point of using that approach. So I, for us, it, that, that type of research is sort of flawed and doesn't give us the answers that, that we really want. All coaches want to know is, is the stuff we're doing in practice making them better in the game? Does it transfer? Mm -hmm. And if, in order to work that out, we need to assess it in the game. And that's the, that is the genuine difficulty. I think there needs to be a bit of a step change in the methodologies used. We need to go to more qualitative technology will help i think around gps and player tracking and ball tracking and you know th th those types of things will help us start to answer those questions to see if the types of movements they're doing in in the games are similar to the types of movements that we're doing in training but the minute you take them out of that training place it's you know it's it's, it's really difficult it's well it's impossible to say whether it transfer because you're you're measuring it in an environment that's not the same as them performance one so for me it's not valid 
Yeah, I know. I, there's a lot of tricky issues, I think. And yeah, you went to that one. The whole point of this is for people to value, develop individual strategies and individual techniques. So to do the classic group means ANOVA makes no sense at all, right? It makes no sense to group people together in the effectiveness of training. So, you yeah, know, um, you think case studies is kind of where we need to go? So my, my PhD, which I'm at the uh, origins of, mm -hmm. supervised by Ian Renshaw and, and Keith David. So we're looking at taking the framework and looking at the effectiveness of environments designed consistent with that framework and seeing what journey we can take the athletes on to learning and seeing if the, there is genuine improvement over seasons or months or time in those athletes as a result of the, the training we're doing. How we're going to measure it and what data we're going to collect and, and stuff is is tricky and that's sort of where we're philosophically at at the minute. It's And then you've got the, the kind of moral issue and ethical issue of we, we can't use with, it, with training groups. We can't interfere with, with people's training. So we can't say you guys are going to do these types of practices and then you players are going to do these types of practices. It, it doesn't fit with the world of elite sport. You can't, you can only really observe and, and kind of take data from what's actually happening and then make sense of it afterwards. The minute you start playing around with it, it's, it's quite difficult. So longitudinal qualitative case studies which bring this stuff to life will be more valuable i think moving forward yeah and, and also the time course and you know when you restrict a skill to reduce it to some simple technical skill you know four weeks of training might be enough to show a significant effect but First of all, it's non-linear by definition, so you might expect yeah. up and downs, you know, to emerge at different times, and then probably a lot longer. You need to look over a longer scale, right, for the full benefit of it. Absolutely, yeah. These these things take time, especially with elite athletes with the law of diminishing returns. You know, it, mm. you see bigger changes with. So yeah, it does take a long time for these these things to happen and change. Four weeks, or you know, training studies, or. You know, you know, or even, even see you see one with two sessions in it and then they measure whether they've improved or not and I just think it's not representative of, of the real world. Yeah. That's, I think that's the West where, where the kind of research community or the start you know, have to have to sort of shift. And and that, you see why why it hasn't happened because the academic integrity requires reliability and, and validity and, and reductionism and I think we need to move away from that. <laughs> Yeah, it just makes it more difficult. <laughs> like it's you're right. yeah. it's not like there's this huge body of research showing that traditional methods have all these benefits no. for transfer because nobody does hardly anybody does transfer research even with tradition any kind of method. So it's been done as well. It's yeah, really hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It takes a long time. So yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a real challenge. Not just even for if you don't use a constraints that approach, we just need more transfer. You need to look at individuals. Yeah. And, and that, that research needs to be done, you know, comparing the both. But I often, you know, where's your evidence for this approach working? And it's like, right, well, where's the evidence for yours? We don't have any either way. I just, and I think we need to start trusting, like, practitioners. Yeah, ex experiential knowledge kind of coaches. I don't know if you want to use the word intuition or whatever you want to use, but they understand a lot of these principles naturally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and they're the ones in there using it, seeing the athletes day in, day out. They're the ones that are going to tell you whether they're improving or not or mm -hmm. think whether things they're doing are working or not. There's a lot. The top the top guys, the guys that are really engaged with it will say that we don't know and we're trying to find out and but we're trying this and we're, you know, we're trying that doesn't feel right and, and I think we tap back in almost to you know, those, those experts and, and really look at what they're doing in their practice to help understand mm -hmm. kind of this transfer thing because they're at the sharp end. It's easy to sit and, and write about you know, theoretically what would work. I, you know, just go and watch the guys in practice and see and see what I think. But for the, that to be accepted as high impact research, I think we're a long way away from that. But mm -hmm. hopefully, we could start to move move that way. Yeah, I think slowly we are, but yeah, we got a long way to go. So easy to do the other <laughs> type of research. And I guess the last question I have for you, Danny, you already talked a little bit about this, but kind of your future direction. So, so you mentioned your PhD project. Is that going to be mainly focused on kind of evaluating the effectiveness of, of constraints yeah. that approach? So we're going to look at two case studies, two life forms, if you like. So a domestic national league team and a international hockey team. And we're going to sort of evaluate how we use a constraints that approach to 
manipulate the affordances for that life form for kind of optimal training and performance. So there'll be, we'll, you know, we'll film all training, we'll film all, all games and, and we'll start to unpick and we'll collect some GPS data and we'll start to unpick what's really happening at different points on the continuum and with practices that do and don't fit with the principles and, and more than it get really get into the detail of, of how we're using this constraints of approach, you know, how, how we're manipulating the ball feed positions and the player ratios and the, the spaces they're in and, and the impact that then has on learning and, and those players it is, is one bit. And I think then there's another piece around how we use this framework to upskill coaches, I think is, is the other piece that I'm really interested in. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds really interesting. Yeah, I think it's it's at that stage where it's ready for this kind of more uh, fine-grained. Because, uh, you know, when people ask about constraints of that approach, you can automatically say, like, small-sided games. That's an example. <laughs> but yeah. I think we're ready for some more uh, detail about what exactly works and doesn't. Yeah, and I think the yeah, the research, oh, there's a piece, of, are we really delivering game sense, which is on rugby. Mm-hmm. You know, they were saying the right words, but they weren't doing what game sense was. And so, like to work on game sense. So, um, there's a disconnect between what they say they were doing and what they're actually doing. So, yeah, there's the practical application of this approach is where it's going to go next. Yeah. And I think it helps me being someone who coaches and who's an academic. And I think that's what I want to take advantage of. So, I've got a foot in both camps. So, I can kind of bridge that gap between the two. Great. Uh, well, thanks for taking some time to talk with me. No worries, my pleasure. Thanks again for the great discussion, Danny. I'm really excited to see the returns from your very exciting and ambitious PhD project. You can find out more about Danny from the links in the show notes. Coming soon on the Perception in Action podcast, can using social media before a big game lead to choking under pressure? This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now. Gone straight away.